Good afternoon, as introduced, my name is Yonghun Kim. Well, I will be standing in here so that I can have a better look at my slide. Well, I have worked for the pharma company for many years. Uh, different companies have different uh, projects um, and also different uh, areas. So I don't uh, say that I have a lot of experience on it. But when it comes to the M3 and S6, actually these guidelines are very extensive guidelines. So I'm just worried uh, whether I can provide a good explanation on all these different parts. And these are the guidelines, so maybe my slides seem to be very uh, busy, uh, containing a lot of words. But I will highlight some important point so that you can also refer to the guideline uh, itself. So by end of this presentation, I hope uh, that you have an overview of the ICH guideline, especially on the safety evaluation, and especially for M3, what kind of the studies, for what duration, in what range, and what time point non-clinical safety studies need to be conducted. These things are the ones that I want to share with you. And uh, pre-clinical safety study, why we do this? Well, of course, we do the preclinical study for the sake of the preclinical study sometimes, but we want to know and share why it is important and why we are doing this. And usually, M3 is dealing with a small molecule, and S6 is dealing with the biopharmaceuticals. So I want to share the difference between the two. And for the people like us who do the safety evaluation, actually the uh, injection into the first human, the first in human dose is really important. So that's also I want to uh, talk about. So if you visit the ICH website, you can see QSEM, which are the quality, safety, efficacy, and multidisciplinary. And today my focus is M, M3. And this require, this is about non-clinical study, safety study, as a part of the multidisciplinary guideline and as the six is a part of the safety guidelines. So here you can see for the S, the safety guidelines, it contains the carcinogenicity and even the oligonucleotide-based therapeutics in S13. So we have like 13 guidelines for the safety part. Well, for the safety part, QT, well, these are very in-depth concepts as we share, as we are shared with the Dr. Kim, the previous presenter. So I will just go over very big concepts here. The details are not easy uh, for all of us, but you can refer to the other uh, guidelines per se when you need more details. So this is ICH M3 and S6. These are all uh, related to the safety. And S6, with the development of the science, there are things to be added and other areas that were not covered fully in S6 are also covered in the addendum. So this shows the relationship between M3 and S6. As I said before, M3 is quite comprehensive. So it covers all the pharmaceutical products. S6 is basically for the biopharmaceuticals I see compared to ICHM3, the S6 is more narrowly focused because it talks about biologics. But still, it's a very representative guideline for the biological product. And more recently, 
we see new moralities, and these new moralities are falling into between these two, like the ADC or ATMP, CT, cell and gene therapy, like that. They were falling into this area. So on the left side, you see the M3. On the right side, S is 6. It seems to be very complicated, but if I may, I can explain for M3 objectives. This is for the uh, clinical trials and market authorization, non-clinical safety study. What kind of the non-clinical safety study need to be conducted when, for what duration, and what kind of the studies need to be conducted? These are uh, delineated in M3. And by harmonizing these different guidelines, the M3 strives to apply three R principles in the non-clinical safety studies. And for the general principles, the target organs or those dependence and the relationship to exposure and the reversibility. So these toxic effects are characterized so that it can be used for the clinical study. For S6, the flexible and case-by-case -case and science-based approach are encompassed. And this is very important Preclinical safety evaluations goal, the primary goal of that is to identify an initial safe dose in human and how we can escalate the dose in human. So this is about the toxicological and safety data and also the identify target organs for toxicity and also study whether such toxicity is reversible or not and also to identify safety parameters for clinical monitoring in human. So these are the primary goals of conducting preclinical safety evaluation in addendum to S6. The species selection, immunogenicity, carcinogenicity. So these are uh, included in addendum. So non-clinical toxicity Researchers, we identify the toxic, toxic uh, effect and whether they are reversible and if there is any AE occurring, then can we manage it and can we predict them? So these are very important things that we try to understand through the safety studies at this stage. The next is about scope. As I said, M3 is a kind of a general guideline. So it encompasses all pharmaceutical products. Pharmacology, general toxicity, and other studies are included. For the case-by-case uh, case basis, phototoxicity or abuse liability, immunotoxicity, they are for the case-by-case case basis. And life-threatening drugs, new modalities, for them, also the case-by-case -case approach is taken. So that's a part of the scope for M3. And in M3, biologics, S6, is not mentioned in detail. However, it provides just the timing of non-clinical studies. And the details are described in S6. In S6, when it comes to scope, the bacteria, mammarian cells, the expression systems, and the cells uh, through these expression systems, and the cytokines, hormone, monoclonal antibodies, and more recently, nucleotide. So these new type of a product are covered by the uh, S6. However, DNA vaccine, cell and gene therapy, are not covered by S6. So here you can see the diagram showing 
type duration timing of non-clinical studies in M3. So like exploratory studies, GLP, toxicology, and phase one, and phase two and three. So different types of the uh, studies for each stage. You can have a overview with this diagram uh, and then you can have a better understanding of uh, two guidelines, M3 and S6. For dose selection, high dose selection, this uh, type of question is very important. For M3, the high dose selection, it's not, it shouldn't exceed MTD, of course, the saturation of the exposure, and the maximum uh, M MFD and limit dose of 1000 mg per kg. So these are recommended for the high dose selection. In terms of the uh, pharmacological effect, about a uh, 50 fold margin. And for the genotoxicity, MTD, MFD, the limit dose are recommended for the high dose selection. Meanwhile, for S6, dose response relationship is important for the toxicity study, and toxic dose need to be shown in while, of course. And for the while, like 15 or 20 years ago, I developed the CSF. And I was participating in the process of the IND application for the U.S. market. The proliferation of the glonoside taking place a lot. So the spleen increases quite a lot. So too much you know, pharmacological effects at the time was not believed to be negative one. But there was a clinical hold from the regulatory body. They requested us to provide a dose where the spleen is not expanded, but it's a pharmacological effect. So even at the low, low dose, the spleen increases or expanded. So we understand that if there is a lobster from the spleen, then uh, there can be some death cases. And actually, de there were death cases before. So FDA saw it as a kind of a AE. So we conducted the study again, and after nine months, uh, we applied the uh, uh, IND again. So I was relatively young at that time. So NOIL, the significance of the NOIL was felt by me at the time, and that was really helpful for me as an experience. In addendum, the high dose selection For the biologics, of course, when it comes to the toxic toxicity, it's more about like pharmacological effect because it has a specific effect. So maximum pharmacological effect above that, of course, the high dose shouldn't exceed that. The clinical expected dose compared to that tenfold exposure over the maximum exposure in the clinic, clinical uh, study. For high dose, you can see the diagram here. As I said, MTD, exposure, saturation, MFD, and 50 times or 50 fold mean exposure margin, maximum, up to the maximum of the uh, MTD. So let me go into more details of the S6. In S6 biopharmaceuticals, actually it is really important to control it well. The contaminant and need to be controlled. And CMC and the manufacturing process. If there is a major changes to the manufacturing process or the formulation, then comparability or the identity, purity, stability, the pharmacological potency, strength, all these items, the comparability study need to be conducted on all these uh, items. 
So as for the material, the batch record need to be well controlled. And when actually the IND applied, the samples for or the characterization of the samples for the preclinical, clinical, and CMC, everything need to be well uh, organized and be submitted to the regulatory body. For the biological activity and pharmacodynamics and the safe pharmacology, actually these are well explained by the previous uh, presenter. So the core battery uh, study need to be conducted for the three as, as, as you can see from the screen and general toxicity study can be combined together for rather than the small molecule for the biologics, the combination or the combined approach can be uh, often witnessed. Safety pharmacology and the pharm uh, parameters, if there are parameters expected to be changed, then the standalone would be taken as an approach. But if it's not the case, then the combined uh, to the general toxicology study or the toxicity study can be a way to go. And M3, S6, actually S6 is very uh, similar to M3 in this area for safety pharmacology. For biopharmaceuticals, a preclinical safety study, actually selecting the species is really important. The target specific, the biopharmaceuticals are very target specific and therefore the, uh, the relevant species uh, species, animal species need to be selected and also the age of the animals and other uh, factors need to be considered. And of course, it should be conducted under the GLP condition. But sometimes there are situations where the compliance with the GLP cannot be obtained, but still you need to provide a justification behind it. If that is the case, then data can be accepted as a part of the package for the IND or the market authorization. But as I said, biopharmaceuticals are very uh, animal specific and also the immunogenicity is really important. And as we saw in the COVID-19 pandemic, cytokines, uh, cytokine storms and other uh, unexpected things can happen. So rather than just providing or applying the conventional approach for all, uh, the case-by-case -case approach uh, can be accepted. Animal species and models, this is important. And as I said before, for the biologics, this is very specific. So expression, epitope distribution, homology, the pharmacologically relevant parameters of the animal need to be very close and very relevant to those of the human. That's critical. So in addendum, these things is described in more detail, like homology and functional activity. And for the monoclonal antibody, the human tissue and animal tissue, like the monkey tissue, for this tissue, so whether the, uh, the material binds that or not, non-specific, so tissue cross reactivity, study uh, is really important uh, as a rationale for the animal species selection. And for the animal species, rodent and non-rodent, the pharmacologically relevant species, if they are pharmacologically relevant, then they can be done for these two uh, species, if the study is like a one month study, but it's a longer one, then it should be different. If it's a one species, of course, uh, it should be done on the one species even for the longer term study. And homologous protein, the use of it, uh, it's just about understanding the hazard, but it's not about right, risk assessment. And how many animals need to be used? For non-rodent, like rabbits or 
monkeys, it's not easy to use large number. So the frequency or the duration of the monitoring can be increased to compensate the smaller sample size. And in, in principle, the monitoring should be done for both species and for both genders. The route and the frequency of administration should be maintained or should be in harsher condition. But if, for example, the exposure is not large and therefore the toxicology study cannot be done when the route of administration is oral, then uh, we can go for the alternative approach. For the recovery, in addendum, it is described for the recovery. Whether there is a recovery from a toxic effect or not, at least one study with at least one dose level. What is important here is that the recovery to the normal condition is not required. The trend of recovery is something that needs to be demonstrated. And for the immunogenicity, for the biologics, of course, it is immunogenic in animals because it is derived from human. And we have to check whether there is an antibody formed or not. Exposures, PKPD, and also the toxicological effects, of course, these things need to be uh, considered. An antibody can be formed so that the early termination may be considered. And here in the case, the pharmacological effect, whether the pharmacological effect is neutralized or the antibody is detected in many uh, animals, and then the early termination can be done. The immunogenicity in these cases is a tool to interpret a toxicological effect. So the fact that there is a immunogenicity in animal does not necessarily mean that there is a immunogenicity in humans. It's not predictive. But still, the toxicological effects in animals the antibody and the exposure in terms of the TKT, P, uh, PKPD and how much the toxicological effects can be neutralized. These things need to be understood. The measuring antibody, the, tox the pharmacological effects can be neutralized or the exposure can change or immune complex can be uh, generated, vasculitis, Globulus, nephritis, uh, anaphylaxis. So these kind of uh, immune-mediated reactions, when we have that, we have to interpret uh, the antibody formation. So PK and TK, we have the section for that separately in M3 and S6. For small molecules in M3, in vitro metabolite plasma protein binding data, they need to be evaluated before the human clinical trials, ADME or the exposure in animals, CYP induction inhibition, the transporter. These need to be also assessed in order to understand the DDI before phase three. And metabolite in animal study, the metabolite need to be analyzed. The drug related total exposure, the 10%, if it's a greater than 10% of the total drug related exposure, then the metabolite need to be assessed and the characterized. And in the toxicity study, if it's a greater than the maximum exposure seen in the toxicity study, then there should be uh, additional study done. 
and the phase three and these studies should be conducted before phase three. And the metaboli, which was not shown in animal study, but shown in human study, then the, in these cases, the metabolite need to be characterized. For biopharmaceuticals in RS6, PK and TK should be conducted in the relevant species. And the clearance mechanism can be mediated or the cytokine, the delayed pharmacological effect. So these things need to be considered. And also radio labeled protein when it is used, then the biological activity need to be well characterized. And although it's not always easy, the dose formulation analysis when it is done one method need to be validated, at least, for like antibody and for the plasma or serum, the biological matrix in that, and the target antibody, their interaction, if there is any interaction between them, uh, need to be also studied. And also metabolite. There is no metabolite for the biologics. The degradation into the amino acid that need to be considered, and therefore there is no need for the metabolism study. So a mass balance study is not needed. For acute toxicity study and single dose toxicity study, like two species and LV50 and lethality that were uh, required, especially for the overdose. And now the DRF study, in the DRF study, these kind of an information can be garnered. So one species, non-GLP is acceptable and before phase three. And for the lethality, uh, this is not parameter anymore. But depression, pain, dementia, for those cases, there is a risk of overdosing situation so for this situation, lethality study data can be very useful. Extended single uh, dose toxicity study for that, for the micro dose in the clinical study, the single dose uh, toxicity study is done. And of course, in this case, the GLP uh, compliance is needed. For the repeated dose toxicity studies, actually, it provides a lot of information in non-clinical stage. Two species need to be used and the duration should be equal to or exceed the duration of the human clinical trials. And immunogenicity or toxic toxicity. So intermittent short-term exposure can be repeated or onco drugs up to nine months of the study are usually uh, recommended. However, in this case, it's six months is recommended. As a six, seven days. Tested duration for the biopharmaceuticals and also for the acute life threatening diseases, two weeks duration is considered. So NDA and clinical studies, trials, stages, what kind of the uh, non-clinical studies they should be uh, conducted. You can see here the duration during the NDA, the longer than the clinical trial, longer than the clinical trials. So rodent, six months, nine months, Non-rodent for the uh, biologics, you can see even for the non-rodent, the maximum period would be six months. That is stated in the addendum. Local tolerance. Now moving on to uh, the local uh, tolerance. Well, it's not done as a standalone study. And it is uh, used uh, for to see what happens around the injection sites 
and the formulation at this time should be very similar uh, to the uh, clinical uh, formulation for the data to have meaning and has to be prepared before phase three. And in case of the biologics, the formulation, if possible, should be similar to uh, the uh, clinical uh, formulation. About immunotoxicity, well, it can not, it shouldn't be done as a standalone study. Also, you have to do standalone uh, toxicity uh, study, and then uh, other uh, things that are related to immune system, such as the uh, changes within the uh, immune system, such as the changes in the uh, spleens, in terms of globulin, in terms of infection, infections, in terms of tumors. And so if there are changes related to immunotoxic uh, indicators, then a further uh, study could be done to do uh, to get uh, more uh, immune uh, toxicity related results before a phase three. And about uh, for the biologics, well itself uh, has uh, has uh, would have uh, a possibility to impact the immune system and there could be inf uh, inflammatory uh, reaction at the uh, injection sites. But uh, for the drugs, uh, rather than using a general approach, it would be better to have a case-by-case -case approach. And about uh, genotoxicity for the small molecules, uh, for a single clinical trial, uh, the uh, metagenesis MG test would be enough. But for the uh, second uh, phase of the clinical study, maybe in vitro, in vivo, a uh, small uh, test uh, could be uh, done before the initiation of the uh, phase two. And if there is, uh, if there needs to be a clarification uh, for the further studies, and uh, comment assays or pig assay could be utilized for that uh, purpose. And about uh, the here addendum, it deals with the uh, of, uh, the genotoxicity of the biologics. And for the DNA and the chromosome, I mean, they would not come in contact, so this would be waived. But even if it's a biologics, but if the organic linker is within uh, the test articles, then for those uh, linkers, uh, the uh, genotoxicity study should be done for that. And about carcinogenicity studies, uh, for small molecules, and it has to be done before the NDA uh, submission of a course, and carcinogenicity, when it uh, when test for carcin uh, carcinogenicity has to be done, is it uh, if if the expected clinical use is at least at six months, and and if the target itself is highly uh, carcinogenic, and if the drug itself uh, has uh, uh, has a very small similar structure to a drug that has uh, had a reported uh, carcinogenic risk, and if there's a hyperplasia and are uh, anticipated. And if a particular uh, tissue, if it stays within a, a particular uh, tissue for a long time, and so if there is a clear uh, geno, uh, gen, uh, geno uh, uh, toxicity is of, uh, confirmed, then a carcinogenicity studies uh, should be con uh, conducted. And a carcinogenicity studies before uh, conducting them, there has to be an approval that has to be gained. And a special protocol assessment has been done. That is to look at the study design. So that study design has to be confirmed by the relevant uh, regulatory organization. And uh, there would be many uh, materials and data required. And you, uh, they have to go through the SPA uh, process. So the uh, approval is gained and then uh, the study is conducted according to the protocol. And if the protocol changes, then there has to be a pre-consultation uh, pre with the FDA. And so because the uh, approval has to be gained. And if there are, and 
So if you see any signs of potential changes, it would be better to have a pre-consultation with the FDA. And so it's very important that uh, the, the, that you uh, detect uh, adverse uh, reactions or uh, unexpected reactions in advance and deal with them. And biologics, the carcinogenicity is not appropriate, uh, so it's not really required. But if the growth factor and if the immunosuppressant agents uh, if those uh, for those sort of uh, substances or uh, drugs, the carcinogenicity study would be required. And, and to, before doing the carcinogenicity uh, study, well, uh, the evidence-based approach is required. And so that all the characteristics of the study material is a uh, well uh, studied to so as to prove that no uh, there's no need for the carcinogenicity studies is required, and if not, then uh, you would have to use a uh, uh, indicator population, and so but you have to use a proliferative marker. KI67 and PCN, uh, the, those uh, ones I have used uh, proliferated markers and I have observed them and provided additional data with those. And this is a reproductive reproduction toxicity study. And at a reproductive uh, cell level, after birth, uh, of the, the growth uh, process, organogenesis or the behavior and the, uh, the skeletal structures. So all these uh, functionalities, whether they are uh, and whether they are impacted by the drugs. So at, there are three uh, studies, SIG1, SIG2, and SIG3 studies are re uh, relate, uh, needed. So in SIG1 is related to fertility and early embryonic development study. And uh, and and then this is usually done of uh, during the organogenesis uh, phase. So until the eighteenth day after the impregnation, to see if there are uh, any uh, birth effects. And in the sec two is related to uh, skeletal studies, and to see if there are any of. Uh, uh, birth uh, defects and sex three is related to pre and post uh, natal development studies. This is, uh, uh, is of the drug is uh, given to the mother until the lacta after the lactation has been weaned, and for the uh, animals they will see overall a uh, behavioral uh, development and to see if they are uh, so. It would look at the overall reproductive functionality, and that is the important part of the reproduction toxicity study. So, if you have time, please uh, uh, read them through. And if you look at the guidelines uh, for the small molecules for men, and um, because in the repetitive toxicity, the uh, reproductive toxicity or the impact has already been studied, so you could just do a phase one and two. Uh, without uh, f additional test, but uh, a male fertility study would be uh, should be done. That is, a sec three should be completed before phase three, and for women of uh, that are not of childbearing uh, potential, they can be included in clinical trials without uh, reproductive toxicity studies. But uh, the problem is with the women of childbearing um, potential because they could get uh, pregnant during the clinical trials. And so there has to be reproduction and toxicity uh, studies have to be uh, utilized in you know, to caution them. But if such a uh, uh, study is not uh, possible, then uh, measures should be taken to prevent uh, preg uh, pregnancy. Embryo uh, without embryo fetal study up until two weeks. Uh, the clinical trial could be done, including uh, these women of childbearing and potential. And so up to 100, uh, up to three months, or there could be a SEC2, uh, uh, spe two species of preliminary SEC2 toxicity data would be required. And uh, for SEC3, 
Oh, excuse me. Uh, the six sh three should be submitted before uh, submission of NDA. And for pregnant women, because it could be quite dangerous, so reproductive toxic study as well as uh, toxicity data as well as human safety data have to be submitted. So in uh, short, you would not be able to do clinical trials with the uh, with pregnant women. And with the uh, biologics, well, uh, this is not very different from M3. However, when it comes to reproduction toxicity study, it has to be done in the uh, so if you think that there's going to be a reproductive toxicity study, there is no need to do a reproduction a toxicity study. And uh, related to fertility, uh, the, it's not easy to do these uh, studies with uh, monkeys. And when it comes to uh, here biology, you have to do the study with the relevant animals, but it's not easy to do this sort of toxicity test uh, with monkeys. And so when there's going to be uh, more than three months of uh, rep uh, repeat those toxicity studies, then um, the hormones, the, the uh, menstrual uh, cycles, all oh, these things have to be observed. And so that could re uh, replace uh, the fertility study part of the reproduction toxicity studies. And in case of monkeys, we cannot use many number of monkeys. And so uh, SEG2 and SEG3 could be done together. And that is an enhanced uh, study. And this would, so this is EPP in the study. So this is uh, from GD20 to uh, birth. And, and, and this could be uh, submitted at the time of NDA submission. And about uh, pediatric uh, pop, uh, clinical trials in pediatric population, uh, well, this is called a juvenile animal studies or JAS. And before doing the clinical trials in pediatric populations, there are some uh, considerations. In adult, uh, so we have to see if there's a case of the drug being used in adult human and what was the safety data in that case. And in normal healthy uh, animals, was there a repetitive uh, toxicology studies or the genotoxic uh, data are available and what the uh, what those data say. And if necessary, the uh, reproduction uh, toxicity data has to be also included. So those data have to be available and reviewed. And uh, if there is a concern, um, then as was mentioned in ICHS 11, there could be uh, a limited uh, study, a JAS study that is. And the most important point to consider while doing the juvenile animal study is that uh, it's the age of the, uh, uh, the, the population that we're targeting. In case of people, it would be built until eight, the age of 18. So for the neonatal, uh, so the neonatal, uh, the the baby and the pre-adolescents, and so if uh, nine week and uh, age 18, or they could be almost of the same level. And also the internal organs, the development, of course, will be, have different uh, development. In case of CNS, it's, uh, they are quite slow in terms of development, and some organs develop more quickly. And so the organ development uh, level and, and the, uh, and the weak, overall age of animals and how the, uh, the aging of animals compared to uh, the aging of people. And about something that is going to be injected uh, chronically. And uh, for the dogs, it would be 12 months. For the rodents, it has to be done uh, at six months. And uh, for dogs at month of 12, their development is complete. So that is why for the dogs, it's set at 12 months. And about the photo safety testing, this is to be done uh, on a case by cases when there is a concern. And for the 
the photochemical property of that small molecule is what counts. In natural lights, if it's about 290 and 700 uh, nanometer, uh, when that is observed, that there's a concern uh, for a photo uh, uh, toxicity. So, so that is why you have to look at the absorption of the lights, and on the and the skin, which will be exposed to, to natural light or to the eye, if there is uh, a distribution to such uh, uh, tissues, then uh, the, there has to be a photo safety uh, test. And that has to be included as part of the clinical phase three uh, submission. And uh, the phototoxicity uh, is well described in S10. And the UV and UV spectrum absorption has to be uh, looked at, and the, ret and the retro study has to be done. And uh, whether it has to be checked where it's the, uh, the, the distribution to skin and eye. And, and then, and the and so depending on this, uh, the, uh, these clinical and non-clinical findings uh, would indicate whether a phototoxicity study would be uh, needed or not. And also uh, abuse uh, tests sometimes uh, could, uh, is sometimes needed. Uh, so drugs that produce a CNS activity uh, would be uh, the drugs that uh, would uh, create uh, concerns, and uh, if during the toxic test, if there is aggressiveness, if there is a hallucination, so those are CNS-related uh, signs. That so, if there are such signs, then uh, then uh, it has to be decided whether the abuse uh, test has to be done, and that data would have to be provided as part of the uh, uh, phase three uh, data submission. And and if there's a, a self-administration method, or so there are uh, these tests that could be utilized to get the abuse uh, test to get the abuse uh, results and other uh, toxicity studies. Uh, the toxic uh, situations mechanism has to be understood as well as the relevant uh, markers, and uh, and there has to be a toxicity study of the, the impurities as well, and this is the combination drug toxicity uh, testing, and and this would uh, be different depending on. The, uh, the stage of development of drugs that are being combined. If it's an early stage, so that is up until phase two, those uh, studies will be decri described as early study uh, drugs, and then and the late will be uh, till like uh, up until phase three or after. If the two drugs are, are both in late stage and uh, they have a lot of cases being used in clinical phase, then a co no combination studies would be uh, needed because the safety has been proven. And but if the two drugs are are in the uh, late stage, however, have not been used much in the uh, clinical uh, setting, then. Maybe uh, the phase three studies of up to uh, three months uh, could be uh, needed. And uh, so for the drugs in the early stage, and therefore a drug that is in the late stage, if they are used in combination, and there is no toxicity study uh, uh, created, about to what month it can be, uh, uh, you could do without the toxicity study. But if uh, the clinical study is going to have a longer duration, then combination toxicity study would be uh, needed. And before the uh, pregnant, uh, uh, for uh, people with the possibility of uh, pregnancy, uh, there would also be a need uh, for uh, the study and uh, a 90 day combination toxicity study uh, could be needed. And so in people, about four dose in humans, and 
And I think there's a separate guideline for this. I think if you could find the guidelines, you could uh, refer to them. And when establishing the first dose, uh, there is the efficacy dose, and there is a uh, minimum effective level dose. And this, uh, the, uh, that's what we call a MABEL a concept. And so after the toxicity, uh, there will be a NOIL uh, data. And so uh, we would set a safe uh, starting dose for humans. What's most important or the what's used the most is NOIL based uh, first dose. So if you cannot get the NOIL numbers, it will be quite difficult to get the first dose, therefore not be able to begin the clinical trials. And that is why a NOIL uh, dose is important. And when going with the NOIL uh, basis, and the uh, there's a conversion to the human equivalent uh, dose. And so the conversion body surface area, a uh, conversion to a body uh, surface area uh, factors are here. You uh, to come up with the human equivalent of uh, doses. And if a person is about sixty kilograms, and then it would be about forty eight uh, kilograms of for animals and the human equivalent uh, dose factors, the safety factor would be about 10. So 10 would be applied here. And so would be about 10 times lower dose would have to be uh, utilized at a starting dose. And uh, among the rodent and non rodent, you would use uh, the one that is more a uh, sensitive one. And so the starting dose that is decided here and pharmacologically active uh, dose would be compared and the lower dose would be chosen as the uh, starting first dose. And, and this uh, concept was the standards. And in 2006, CD 28, agonistic antibody was developed in uh, UK and for monkeys and so they uh, decided on the first dose based on NOEL and, but within a few days young volunteers would uh, develop of uh, uh, have a, ne a necrosis that was a big issue and so a, a very severe uh, toxicities uh, were generated and this was so no IL concept besides that for the high risk therapeutic proteins marble mabel uh, that would so this would be the minimum uh, effect a dose that has to be calculated to uh, give to the patient. So that concept of Mabel was introduced. So right now, so the Mabel base is the most safest way, and then PAD base or the NOIA basis. So those are the three uh, the concepts that are applied in order to estimate the first dose. And this is not related to the guidelines, uh, but personally, uh, these are the factors uh, that I always keep in mind as you look at the toxicity uh, data. Uh, in, for the, uh, the first dose, I said the default value is 10. Uh, but if the default value could be more higher than 10, like 20, to get lower dose, to get safety. So there are cases when uh, such factors uh, would be needed. And so uh, such uh, situations uh, would uh, require more caution. So if the, there's a, for instance, steep dose response curve and, and oh, if there is a toxicity that cannot be monitored, 
if there's a sudden death without uh, pre uh, symptoms and there's also available by availability or the irreversible uh, toxicity and so if in the key organs if you have uh, the uh, toxicity then safer uh, first dose has to be calculated in those cases i think uh, the safety factor would be increased to be higher than 10. and for the uh, exploratory of uh, uh, clinical trials and when you do in the clinical trials, you just want to take it to see, you know, to see if it's safe or not. And so this is about about 100 microgram of uh, in a single uh, administration in person, and about 500 micron for over the day of five days. So this is a minimal dosage, or there could be just a single of, of administration. So there would be a sub therapeutic doses. And if they could also be administered for 14 days, which would be approach five. And you have to see if they bind well to the receptors, and if is there if it would be possible to get some information about the exposure, and so that is the purpose of the exploratory uh, clinical trials, and so uh, and what sort of non-clinical studies should be done for that uh, purpose? There could be safety uh, pharmacology uh, study has to be done to get the MOA data, and. Or the extended single dose of toxicity studies, and at a 14 day, there could be in two species, uh, there you would need a repetitive uh, toxicity studies and a genome toxicity study. Sometimes it would also uh, be uh, required, and initially. And so maybe the SAL uh, analysis data would also be required. Uh, for the small molecules, that is uh, M3, axis, which is about the biologics, uh, in terms of differences, well, uh, I have listed here all the differences. In terms of metabolism, the small molecules uh, would, ha would need a metabolite, but in biologists, they would be uh, uh, catabolized or degraded. So there's no need to have mass a balance a study. And in terms of uh, toxicity, for the small molecule, because of the off-target effect concern, a uh, toxicity study has to be done. However, for the biologics, target a specific pharmacological effect could be a uh, toxic uh, for the high dose and there could be like a 50 fold to clinical exposure and for the biologics it would be like a 10 fold exposure uh, would uh, should be uh, sufficient and for the specialty uh, they have to use of uh, uh, in the biologists, they have to use a pharmacologically relevant um, animals. So the monkeys are used, and for the small molecules, they would utilize rat and dogs. And for the small molecules, in terms of CLC, well, for the biologists, it's quite uh, simple. And for the genome toxicity for biologics, uh, the that that sort of study is not needed. But for the small molecules, it is needed. And, and this is about when the safety study has to be done for as part of the non-clinical uh, uh, non, uh, clinical study. Uh, most of them has to be done before uh, phase three. And on this, we're back in 2015. At a company that I was working for at the time, I did a lot of DD and related to uh, non-clinical studies uh, with the uh, I have received many questions from the counterparty companies I have listed all these questions I mean these are quite uh, of normal uh, questions but these are uh, so these are the types of questions that I received and I have received quite a bit of them
And the question is as to why uh, the uh, study animal died. It's quite difficult to answer. As sometimes well there are many a uh, safety of uh, gauge to prevent death but despite that uh, the study animals died have died so uh, the cause of death if possible should be identified and I think that would be quite good for that compound to uh, to be approved and about the target ordinance and sometimes it's uh, the target ordinance are not very clear so it is important that uh, there's clear definition or the clear identification of the, t uh, the target organs, as well as the toxicity and mechanism, and also uh, whether there's appropriateness of the NOIL. Because uh, the NOIL is used at the CRL level, that does not mean that the authorities are going to approve. So you have to have uh, sufficient rationals to include NOIL in the submission data. Just because the CRO has a very high level of NOIL does not mean that it's going to uh, be approved by the authority right away. So there has to be an appropriate level of uh, NOIL. And also uh, the, the relationship between uh, toxicological findings in animal toxicity studies and the findings in human, so whether there's a correlation. And so there is the general, uh, general toxicity. Where, or, so related to uh, metabolites, there has to be a proven a safety. And so related QT prolongation potentials. Uh, so these are uh, these questions you may wonder. I mean, they're so natural. I mean, they of course have to be satisfied. However, uh, they do ask a lot of questions about the rational. For instance, about the dose, about the species of use. So sometimes uh, these are very clear questions, but it's sometimes difficult to answer. And about the efficacy test, that's part of the efficacy test. And it, the compounds that we are developed as a standalone, we usually do uh, the efficacy test for that standalone. Even if we have reference product, we would use all the reference uh, product. And uh, so the efficacy data required by the global pharma is that compared to your compound, would the, that has, I mean, would they have the same mechanism as the most popular compound? And they want to see uh, the comparability uh, result. And it has to be the results of a head-to-head -head, uh, study. And it, this is not easy to uh, uh, supply because it's difficult to get uh, the competitive drug. And however, it seems that the, uh, this sort of data is given a lot of uh, importance. And so there has to be uh, the uh, head, uh, the right uh, head to head data with the reference uh, uh, competition. And with the uh, regulatory authority, If just because the drug has the same uh, MOA does not mean it's exactly the same uh, uh, material, the same compound. And so they sometimes Uh, sometimes you would need to uh, submit a data that is based on the same class of uh, uh, drug, but sometimes uh, uh, the uh, the re uh, regulatory uh, authority require more strict uh, data. And also when giving uh, answers, whether uh, this is really related to uh, drugs, uh, the uh, historical background data from the CRO is quite important. But uh, there are some uh, CROs that are not able to provide such a uh, data. And about uh, carcinogenicity, 
So maybe the full uh, preclinical talks of plants are sometimes uh, required. And sometimes uh, the people from the Seattle have to, sometimes they change uh, the tissue related slides. There are cases like that. And about the messages. Uh, the guidance are, are high-level basic concepts and principles. And so it's important to read uh, between the lines when it comes to a uh, guidance. And uh, you need a flexible and case-by-case -case approach. And you also need a science-based approach. And of course, you would need a weight of evidence approach as well. It's easy to say. But uh, for us uh, toxicologists, uh, these are quite difficult to implement. And because of such approaches, uh, uh, because these approaches are required, of the, uh, there is a need uh, for uh, toxicologists. So, of course, if the, the stricter the approaches, the, the co higher the cost will be, and therefore you would need a more uh, frequent uh, communication with the authorities. When setting the test items, there has to be a clear uh, justification for them. And, of course, uh, the three R ha principles have to be emphasized. And so, uh, the non-clinical uh, trials, they should not be done just for uh, the, uh, the sake of it. It has to be somewhat connected to the clinical trials because the clinical trials are f uh, trials that are conducted for the, uh, for the development drugs for the humans. And there are the uh, regulatory uh, org uh, the authorities require so, uh, integrated interpretation of all the data. So to have understanding of uh, risks versus uh, benefits. Because even if there's a little bit of a risk, if the, the benefit is great, the, uh, the drugs are approved, uh, such as the anti-cancer drugs and the uh, uh, dementia-related drugs, because uh, the benefit is greater than the risks, those uh, drugs do tend to be approved. And I want to thank you for your attention.